The time has come, my friends, to sit down and walk through how to plan an amazing backpacking trip for you and your friends. So pull up a chair, grab your notebook, let's get into it. Today we're gonna to break down the nine essential steps to planning an amazing backpacking trip. The first step is figuring out who's gonna be in your party. Who's going on this backpacking trip with you or are you going solo? After we've done that, we're gonna figure out the location. Where is it that you wanna go on your backpacking trip? Is there a certain state or a certain park that you've really been wanting to get out to? Once you've chosen your location, we're gonna spend some time talking about dates and the season and also duration. How many days and how many nights do you plan on being out in the backcountry? Following that, we'll talk about picking out a specific trail, which is probably the most research intensive part of planning a backpacking trip. So we'll make sure you go into a lot of detail on that to make sure we're picking the right trail for you and for your party. Once you've selected that trail, we're gonna to wanna to know whether or not you need a permit to actually camp there. So we'll figure out whether you need that or not, and we'll talk through how you actually apply for a permit and then how you pick one up. Once we've sorted out the permit situation, we'll wanna talk about gear. When we talk about gear, we'll keep in mind the specific trail and the specific season that you're gonna be traveling in because that's actually gonna make a big difference what type of gear you actually decide to bring on your trip. After we've sorted out the gear, we've got that all figured out, we'll talk about travel and logistics. How are you gonna get to the trail and then how are you gonna get home? Are you flying and what considerations might you need to think about if you are flying out to your trailhead. Next, we'll move on to safety. Obviously, you're gonna be out in the back country, we want you to have a good time, but we also want to make sure that you're safe. So how can we make sure that that is true? Last but not least, I'll go over some tips. Some of the things that I've learned when I've been out in the back country that hopefully you won't make the same mistakes that I made and you'll just have a great time and not have to think about any of that stuff. Step number one is figuring out who's going on this adventure with you. Are you going to be going by yourself on a solo backpacking trip? Are you gonna be going with friends? How many friends are you going with? And what are their experience and fitness levels? One of the tricks and ways that you can get people to commit or know that they're committed is once they start spending money. So if they buy gear, then you're probably pretty safe to know that this person's gonna show up and, and come on the trip with you. If they had to buy a plane ticket, even better, because that's an expensive uh, proposition for somebody to go through to ultimately not show up for a backpacking trip. So. As a planner myself, oftentimes that's my like check the box mark once someone spent a meaningful amount of money on gear or they have bought a flight. I know that this person is in for the trip and I've planned all kinds of trips all over the place. Um, and that is typically the most reliable indicator on whether or not someone is gonna show up the first day of a backpacking trip. Now that we know who's in our party, the next step is picking a location. Where do you wanna go on this backpacking trip? A lot of folks are gonna be going with groups or they've had experience. So for those folks, typically people have somewhere in mind, right? Whether it's a video that they watched or a friend that they talked to who just went on an adventure, but usually they have one or two places in mind that they're thinking about going on a trip. Oftentimes that's either a state park or it's a national park, whether it's the Rocky Mountains National Park or if it's along the John Muir Trail. I recently went to the Ray Lakes area out in the High Sierras. Phenomenal loop, highly recommend it. I'll link it in the description below and also post it up here above. But if you've got that dream spot, now's the time to do a little more research, invest in it and see what's possible. If you're going solo and it's your first time, I would definitely go local. I would go to a place maybe where you've gone hiking before and see if you can spend one night out and backpack. That way you bring your gear in, you set up camp for the night, you get some experience. And then that way, if you wanna expand from there, you've got a foundation that you're building on. That helps us transition really nicely into our next topic, which is dates and duration. So the first thing that I would think about when it comes to dates and the time of year that you're gonna be going is the weather and the pros and cons to going during different weather windows. Typically, if you're going during spring, what you can expect are high river crossings. So if there's a river that is part of your trail that you typically would need to cross on foot, those rivers are gonna be much higher. So you're probably gonna to have to wade through a river to get across the other side. So think about that. Is that something you feel comfortable doing? Is that something you feel safe doing? There's a lot of research you can do online. Of people who've done that same hike or that same backpacking trip during the same month that you're considering, and I would read those reviews and see what those people had to say about it. How high was the water? How fast flowing was it? And think through, is this something that you're up to the task for? Because if you get to that river and then you aren't able to cross it or don't feel safe crossing it, then that's really gonna kind of ruin your trip. There will be a lot of flowing water, so you'll have easy access to water. 
more easy access than normal. So if you're thinking about going on a backpacking trip in summer, some of the things that I would think about are heat and the location that you're going to be. During the midday sun, is it going to be really hot? Is there a lot of tree coverage? Is there not a lot of tree coverage? What's that gonna be like when you're actually hiking with a pack on and you're going a bunch of miles? Are you gonna feel comfortable in that sort of environment? So I'd look at the location that you're considering that we just discussed. And I would also look at the months that you're considering going and I'd Google that quite frankly and just see what the weather looks like during those months when you would potentially be there. Additionally, you can expect more bugs in the summer. Typically in the mid to late summer is when you're gonna see the most bugs. So that's things like mosquitoes and gnats and black flies and things like that. Things that kind of bring down the mood a little bit. I've been on trips before in Banff and Canada where we had swarms of mosquitoes every day, all day. And it was not awesome. <laughs> it was not awesome. Um, additionally, sometimes, especially in the later summer months, like August, for example, permits can be really difficult to get. They get to be a really popular time because the weather's starting to cool down. There are less bugs than there were earlier in the summer. It's also before kids typically go back to school, so people are more able to, to book those days and those months. So keep that in mind as you're planning your trip. The odds of you getting a permit are, are probably the most uh, unlikely, unfortunately, in August or potentially September. This will obviously depend on where you live and what hemisphere you're in and all those sorts of things. But if you're in North America and you're interested in going backpacking, for me, I really like the end of September and the first half of October, somewhere in there. Um, it gets cooler, so you gotta keep that in mind. At night, it can get pretty cold depending where you're at. Maybe mid 20s, maybe even low 20s uh, while you're asleep at night. Uh, but it's typically, again, depending on where you're at and the altitude that you're at, you're gonna be looking at more like temperatures in the 60s and things like that during the day, which for me is kind of like the perfect backpacking temperature. And then winter backpacking. So winter backpacking, I would reserve for people who are experienced and have a lot of experience with their gear. It's also a lot more expensive to go winter camping because a lot of the gear that you would typically buy is three season gear. And you really can't bring that when you go snow camping. And you kind of always need to be ready for snow because if you're going somewhere where it could snow, you should kind of just expect it to snow. So we've talked a lot about dates. Let's talk about duration. How many nights, how many days are you planning for your backpacking trip? Typically speaking for newer folks, it's good to start on the smaller number of nights and days, one night, two nights, maybe go over a weekend, maybe make a long weekend, make it three days and two nights. Say six nights is probably about where you want to cap out. You can maybe go a little bit further, seven, eight nights without getting some kind of resupply or hitting a town where you can get some more food. I think the sweet spot for me is probably around four nights, four to five nights. Uh, and then you really get a chance to get out there. You're not gonna see day hikers when you're out there. You're not gonna have the same experience that people could have just driving their car to a trailhead and hiking for a day. And that sort of solitude and that kind of earning the view is one thing that I think is really neat about going backpacking and a big reason why I'm into it so much. Okay, everybody, it's time for the big question. Which trail are you going to hike on your backpacking trip? This is probably the area where we're gonna spend the most time doing research, maybe outside of gear, if you are really in love with gear, but otherwise, this is where you're gonna spend the most time and energy. It's gonna be finding the right trail for you and your party and coordinating the logistics of making sure that you can make that happen. So there are quite a few elements that go into thinking about how to choose the trail that you're going to take. I'm gonna walk you through all those elements first and then I'll share resources with you at the end that will make that process a little bit easier and it'll give you some ideas probably on where you might wanna go backpacking. So the first two parts are distance and elevation change. If you're going with people who are experienced and they've been on a lot of trips in the past, they're gonna know a lot of the ropes you probably have a pretty good idea of what kind of pace they can they can do per day and what kind of trail length and duration you're probably going to want to do. If it's someone who's new and they've never gone backpacking before, my general advice is to do something local and do something small and short. Whether that's a one night overnight backpacking trip just to get them used to what that process is like 
or if it's something that you want to do that's a little bit longer, just keep in mind that you're going to want to think about their fitness level. You know, you want to be realistic about what kind of plans you're getting people into. You don't want them to go and have this terrible experience on their first backpacking trip and then they never want to go out again, right? So even if you might be able to do 10, 12, 14 miles a day, that doesn't mean this brand new person can do it or wants to do it. Typically, if I was planning a trip and I'm going with people who are on, I would say like the newer side of backpacking, I would probably aim for six to eight miles per day and vertical elevation gain. I would try to keep it maybe 2000 or less, 2500 or less is probably fine. Next up is planning the actual route that you're gonna be taking. Is this a loop route? Is this an out and back? Is this an end to end where you start at one trailhead and you end at a different trailhead? You need cars at both locations. What type of trail are we looking at? And as you start to plan that out and you do the mileage per day, you start to think about individual campsites. You also want to think about water and where are the sources of water you're going to find along the hike from stop to stop to stop. So I typically would map out every single day. I'm gonna be starting at this location, I'm gonna to go to this other location, it is such and such amount of miles, it's such and such amount of elevation change, and along that route from day one to day two, I'm going to cross these two sources of water. So I know that I have a reliable place to fill up. Obviously you're not gonna to wanna to bring all the water with you that you need for your whole trip, unless it's a really short trip, so you're gonna to need to have a filtration system and reliable sources of water, throughout your journey. So you wanna bake that into your planning as you think about which sites you're staying at and what sources of water are you gonna find from the morning you wake up to when you're setting up your tent for, for sleep. Other things you're gonna to wanna to think about when planning your trip and choosing your trail is elevation in terms of weather. So sometimes you can get snow at high altitudes where you wouldn't expect snow, at lower altitudes, and it can catch people off guard from time to time. And make sure that you know, are you gonna need micro spikes or things like that if there's potential for there to be snow or ice at higher elevations? Are you gonna need a different sleep system with a higher R value for your sleeping pad? What's the degree rating for your sleeping bag? Remember, the degree rating on your bag that is the like lower limit. That is not the comfort level. If you have a 20 degree bag and it's 20 degrees out, you're gonna be cold. It's more like 35 degrees is where you'll be comfortable in a 20 degree bag. So keep all of that in mind as you're thinking about the trip, thinking about what gear that you have. Would you and your partners and friends need to buy more gear to be comfortable in that environment during that month that you've decided you're gonna go? A few other things to think about when it comes to specific trails are fires allowed at the locations that you're gonna be going to. So if you're thinking it's gonna be cold, but it's okay, we'll be able to have fires, you might wanna check, because some places you can't have fires, particularly over a certain elevation. You're also gonna to wanna to check to see if there are permits required. This is incredibly important. We will get into this in detail in just a minute. When it comes to using the restroom in the woods, which is everybody's favorite topic, right? You're also gonna to need to figure out if it's a place where you can bury your waste or for something you need to pack out. If you need to pack it out, there's special bags that you can bring with you. It's not fun, no one wants to do that, no one likes having to do that, but there are places where you need to do it. Last but not least, do you need a bear canister where you're going? Little secret, not a huge fan of bear canisters, but they're very important. If a trail requires bear canisters, you gotta pick one up. It's a safety thing, it's also the safety of the animals that are out there in the wilderness as well. And you don't want all your food to get eaten when you're multiple days away from your car. So bring a bear canister if you need one, do your research and figure out if that's required. If a bear canister is not required, then you can put your food in a bag and hang it from a tree. You should do some research on your own to figure out how to do that or make sure someone in your party knows how to do it and has done it before. But ultimately, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that your food is protected and that you're following the rules. And part of that is doing research on whether or not a bear canister is required. So let's talk about resources for a second. The one resource that I typically use the most when I'm picking out a trail for my backpacking trip is alltrails.com. I personally think this is the most useful resource that is out there on the internet because it has such a wide breadth of information. I like to use all trails for planning out the specific campsites that I'm staying at night after night after night because all trails will include all of the campsites on the website. So I can say, okay, this is the trail. I know what the loop looks like, for example, and I know all the sites that I can camp in along the way. Then I can map out how many miles per day I think is reasonable for me and my group 
I can also overlay the elevation gain that I can expect for any given point to point. So if I'm staying at campsite A and I need to go to campsite B and I'm trying to choose where that campsite is going to be, I can say, okay, if I go here, it's gonna be 6.5 miles and it's only 1,500 feet of elevation. If I go to the next campsite, it's gonna be nine miles and it's going to be 2,000 feet of elevation. I'm gonna go with the second option because it's actually relatively flat. I'm not looking at that much elevation gain. And I think if it's pretty flat, we can do nine miles, no problem. So that's really helpful for me, right? Because I can plan out the whole loop. I can put it in a spreadsheet that's shared with all of my party mates, and they can all see the specifics and plans of the details on how much they can expect for each day. I can save a copy of that, just take a screenshot of it, or I can write it down somewhere. That way, when we're actually out in the backcountry, we know which days are gonna be bigger days and which days are gonna not be as big. It also helps me with planning my food because if it's gonna be an extra big day, maybe I'll throw some more energy chews in my bag for that specific day because I know I'm gonna need some extra energy. But when you wanna go through that specific planning process and picking out a trail and actually the campsites you're staying at, All Trails is phenomenally helpful. Beyond that, All Trails also has a community feedback section where people can provide reviews and feedback on the different trails. And the four star, five star thing is kind of useful, I guess, because you can kind of get a general sense on whether or not a trail is good or not, or, or beautiful or scenic or not. That being said though, I think the most useful thing about that feedback bit is the actual words and information that people are sharing with you. That beta and that information is incredibly valuable and I use it in two different ways. First way I use it is when I plan out the specific season that I'm gonna be going on that backpacking trip and that specific trail, I like to go back to preceding years during that same time window to see what the conditions were like. If I'm going over a pass, was it really snowy? Would I need micro spikes? Keep in mind that every season's different, but it's good for a general gauge and assessment. You can also look at things like river crossing. So if I'm gonna be crossing this particular river and it's April, let me look at the last three Aprils and see if that river crossing was passable or if people had big issues. So I'm gonna go into all the feedback and all the details and all trails to figure that out. That's one way that I use it. The second way that I use it is I look at the most recent reviews right before I go out on the trail. Those will oftentimes be helpful as well so they can give you like what is the real time feedback. That can tell you things about the wildlife that is in the area. It can tell you about the bugs that are in the area which is really useful. Do I need to bring a bug? Uh, net or do I not need to bring a bug net depending on how bad those reviews are looking. That kind of stuff is really helpful for making those last minute decisions on any modifications you might want to make to your gear that you're actually going to bring out on trail with you. Finally, All Trails also has an app that you can use when you're actually out in the backcountry and it uses satellite information, not any sort of cell service which you probably won't have when you're in the backcountry to be able to actually mark your progress along the trail as you're going about your hike. This is pretty cool because it gives you a real time view on like how far into the hike you are for that day. It can tell you how many more feet of vertical elevation gain you have for that day. And it is a good just sort of sense check on like, okay, let me make sure I'm pacing myself appropriately. Let me make sure that I haven't passed the campsite that I'm trying to get to somehow. Did I miss it? So it's really helpful in that regard. I would not rely solely on that. I would also bring some other form of navigation, whether it's a paper map or more redundancy in terms of like downloaded maps on other people's phones in your party. I wouldn't rely just on that, but usually it does work. And when it does work, it is really, really cool. Okay, we're shifting over into permits. Let's talk about permits. Some of you may be able to skip this section because the hike and the backpacking trip you're gonna do doesn't require a permit. So you can go ahead and just skip ahead to the next chapter. But if you do require a permit, let's get into some of the details of things you wanna think about, where you can find information in the permitting process, uh, and also some odds and likelihoods that you will actually get a permit depending on what kind of trail you are trying to hike. So the first thing you wanna do once you've figured out the trail that you're hiking on and you find out that it does require a permit is you're gonna to go to either that state park website or you're gonna to go to that national park website. The website's really helpful. They have a lot of information on the site, not just related to permits, but a lot of other things about the park and things you can expect. So generally a good resource anyways. A key date that you're gonna to wanna to look out for is an application window for a permit. Certain places have specific application windows that open up on a certain date for a certain starting date for your backpacking trip. So for example, it might say on April 1st, we we're gonna be giving out permits that start October 1st. So you wanna make sure you know what those dates are. There's lots of different websites out there that have calendars in addition to the actual state or national park website, but figure that out and make sure that you 
aren't caught unaware that you need to apply for a permit, sometimes really far in advance. Otherwise, you're just going to be bummed because you didn't get to go on the trip that you wanted to go on and you didn't realize it. Now you would need to wait a whole nother year to plan that backpacking trip. So do your research on that early. So what goes into a permit application typically anyways? Usually what you're going to submit over to the state or national park is going to be the size of your party, how many people are in the group. You're going to say how many days you want to be out in the backcountry. You're going to give the specific dates that you will be out there and the dates that you are going to be at each individual campsite. So you're gonna to have to pick those campsites before you make that request for a permit in most cases. And sometimes they'll even ask you if you wanna apply for multiple alternate routes or alternate campsites to try to make sure that you get one. Because essentially it's a first come first serve. So if you try to get a campsite, but someone else has already reserved it for that day and the group size has already met its capacity, they're gonna cross out that application. And they're gonna look at your second alternative if, if that's something that they offer. So um, those are the things you're gonna expect when you actually fill out an application. Typically it takes a little while to hear back uh, on those applications. It can range from anywhere from a few days depending on the size of the park to honestly like several weeks or even sometimes longer than that. Um, so you might wanna check with the local ranger's office there and call them just to see how long you think it might be before you hear back. So that way you know if you should start playing for something else. If you're planning a trip that's in a really popular area, you know it's heavily trafficked, or based on your research, you find out that it's a really popular backpacking loop or a specific area, my recommendation would be to have a backup plan. If you've got the people already identified to go on a backpacking trip, people are already starting to, starting to buy gear, people are getting excited about this concept of getting out in nature, it'd be a real bummer to not get your permit and then just not go on a backpacking trip at all. So I'd recommend coming up with an alternative Maybe one that doesn't require a permit just in case you get really unlucky in some kind of like permit lottery situation. So let's say you get your permit, then what happens? Typically what you do is you go to the ranger station that's closest to the trailhead that you're starting at and you pick up your permit there. Also, you can sometimes print them out online, but usually it's something you're gonna pick up in person. Last but not least, typically there's a walk-up permit option as well. Um, this is typically a, a certain allotment of permits that are given out on site at the ranger station. This can work pretty well if it's a local hike or a local backpacking trip for you. But if it's somewhere that's farther away, obviously in another state or a long drive, this is kind of a big gamble. And I typically would not recommend it because if it's you or especially you and a group of people, you don't wanna show up and find out that you didn't get the on site walk up permit and then you're stranded somewhere and you're not doing what you wanted to do. Packing and gear is up next, everybody. Everyone's favorite topic. People love talking about gear. I love talking about gear. We're not gonna get to all the specific details of all of the gear that I would bring on a backpacking trip. We're gonna save that for another video. You can check the description below. I'm gonna put one in there once that video is made. However, if you do wanna get a chance to look at some of the gear that I recommend that's under 50 bucks, some of my favorite stuff, I'll put a link right up here for you. That being said, Let's talk through the big buckets of things you need to consider when you're packing and when it comes to gear. So first of all is food. And you're gonna think about calories per day. Typically I would recommend 2,500 to 4,000 calories per day. That's gonna depend on the mileage you're doing and the amount of vertical elevation change that you're doing. Uh, the more mileage obviously and the more elevation, the more you're gonna to be towards that 4,000 calories a day spectrum. And on the other end, you know, be at the more like the 2,500 calories per day. Bring stuff you're gonna wanna eat, because if it's in your pack and you don't wanna eat it, it's not doing anybody any good. Make sure that you plant your calories per day. I like to do this using Ziploc bags. I'll basically take all the food for a day, I'll sort out what's gonna be my breakfast for that day, it's gonna be my lunch for that day, which is typically just a bar, and then what's gonna be my dinner for that day, and what snacks am I gonna have along the trail as well. And I put it all in one Ziploc bag. And I'll even put a piece of paper that says day one. And I put it in the bag with the food. That way I know I'm rationing my food appropriately. I know exactly what I have lined up for that day. And that's just the way I like to do it because then I know that I'm set up for success. I have the peace of mind of knowing I've planned out all my meals. I'm not gonna eat too much in the beginning of the trip and not have enough food at the end. It can be a lot of fun to bring something unique on the trip as well. So I like to bring salami, for example. 
That way I can share it. It's really easily shareable. If your friends go with you and they bring their own thing that's a little unique and it's shareable, it's a cool way to kind of mix it up and like try something different and not have the same food every day. Uh, so yeah, trading on the trail is a real thing. Trading with friends is definitely gonna happen. Someone is gonna bring too much food, so you're gonna get free snacks. That's definitely gonna happen. Uh, someone's not gonna bring enough food and they're gonna be begging for snacks, so that's gonna happen. Um, so you're gonna see all this stuff over your experience out in the backcountry when it comes to food. But my ma main recommendations, get your calories per day right, make sure you're organized so you ration appropriately, get some variety in the food that you're bringing and try out the food that you're gonna bring too. Eat it beforehand, see if you like it. Don't just buy it and then pack it and then realize when you're on the trail, like, oh my gosh, I can't eat another bite of this. This is disgusting. Because that will happen. Because backpacking food doesn't always taste very good. Next up, sleep system. You're gonna wanna think about how are you gonna set yourself up for success when you're going to bed. So that's gonna be two main things and then a few extra tips that I'm gonna give you for a good night's sleep out in the backcountry. The first thing is your sleeping pad. What kind of sleeping pad are you bringing? Are you bringing up an inflatable sleeping pad or are you bringing up one that is not inflatable? You're gonna to wanna to think about the weather and the time of year, like I mentioned earlier, to determine what kind of R value and what kind of insulation you're gonna want for your uh, sleeping pad. This is a huge deal that often gets overlooked. A lot of people spend a lot of time thinking about what degree bag, sleeping bag, they're bringing and how does that relate to the weather they can expect. But they don't spend that much time thinking about the sleeping pad, which is a major mistake because the sleeping pad really keeps you warm and if you don't bring the right sleeping pad, even if you have like the perfect sleeping bag for the situation or even a warmer bag than you should need, you're gonna be cold because your body heat is just reaching out through the bottom of that sleeping pad and that cold air from the ground is just sucking the warm heat out of your body and you will not be happy. I did have this one experience one time where my tent mate, their sleeping pad went flat and they were newer to backpacking and camping. So I gave them my sleeping pad because I didn't want them to give up on this thing forever. And I still am glad that we, I did it, but it was very cold. It snowed that night. It was so cold. It was so cold. Um, so my point is make sure you have a sleeping pad that is rated correctly for the temperature. And then also make sure you bring a patch kit with you. All inflatable sleeping pads come with a patch kit as far as I know. So make sure you bring that. Don't leave that little baggie at home because it's not doing you any good there. You're going to want it just in case something crazy happens. Uh, it's the only time I've ever seen that happen. Um, but better be safe than sorry. So those extra tips that I was telling you about when it comes to a sleep system, I would bring these if I were you because I think they're gonna give you a better night's sleep, which is really important when you're out in the back country. One of those is a sleeping mask and the other is earplugs. Um, those just help you sleep a lot better. They keep the light out. Sometimes the moon is actually super bright in the back country. So do yourself a favor, pick those up, bring those with you. And then also, if you're going out somewhere where it's a little bit colder than your bag is rated for, another thing that you can do is buy a sleeping liner for your sleeping bag that you can slide in there and add some warmth to your setup. So it's a little bit of a hack to help get you through maybe 10 degrees cooler weather than your bag normally would be comfortable in. Shelter is up next. Where are you sleeping? What are you sleeping under? How are you staying dry? And keep a little warmth near you at night. I typically would just recommend people buy a tent when they're new. Um, there's other more advanced sleep systems that you can get into and we'll probably get into those in future videos. But if I'm a new backpacker um, or even an experienced one, I still use a tent even though I know there's a lot of lighter options out there. I would go with a tent. I would typically go with buying a two or a three person tent personally because the weight that you save by getting a one person tent versus a two person tent is really negligible. And if you buy a two person or even a three person tent, you just have a lot more options. If you go with a friend, you can split the gear, he can bring the poles, you can bring the rest of the tent. So you save weight that way. So if I was to go out and buy a tent right now or a shelter right now, I'd probably go with a two person tent or maybe a three person. Um, just depending on how much space you might want to have if you go with a buddy. Water. So how are you going to clean your water and how are you going to store your water? That's the main things you need to think about when it comes to gear and water. 
what kind of water purification system are you going to be bringing? Are you going to bring uh, a smaller version filter? Are you going to bring a, a large filter? Are you going to be bringing a stirry pen? Are you going to be bringing a grail to you know pump the water out through that, that process that they have with that filter in the grail? Figure out what you're going to do when it comes to water. My general recommendation is you want to have redundancy as much as possible when it comes to water filtration. So if you're going with another person, I would make sure you have at least two water filters uh, just in case. And if you have more than that, if you have five people, this might be a weight savings opportunity where you can bring two water filters or maybe three across the group. Um, that way you all can save a little bit of weight. Sometimes it's nice just to have your own so you can kind of just do your thing whenever you want to do your thing. I'll leave that up to you all to figure out how much it's worth the trade-off a little extra weight savings to convenience. When it comes to storing water, there's basically two options. You can either bring bottles or you can bring a water reservoir. So figure out which is right for you. I personally have transitioned over from bringing a water reservoir or hydration reservoir over to bringing bottles. I like the ability to see how much water I have left in the water bottle. I have an easy access system so I can get it out real quick. So I'm a big fan of the water bottle myself. Um, I think having the hydration system can be great. Uh, but at the same time, I like to know how much water I have left without having to pull that hydration system all the way out of my pack. You'll find that once you're out there in the backcountry, you're not going to want to be taking your backpack off and putting it back on, taking it back off. It's just a huge pain. I actually have my preferred choice right here. It's a one liter smart water bottle. Uh, these are actually really popular amongst the backpacking community. Uh, it's a good shape. It's got a standard screw on top. And um, you can actually connect this with certain water filters and drink straight out of the bottle with the water filter attached at the end. So just figure out a way to make sure that you have some way to store water when you're out there. Uh, I would say it's a good idea generally to have like two liters worth of storage, whether that's counting your water filter bag plus a one liter water bottle, or it's having a hydration reservoir that's at least two liters. Uh, that way you have some flexibility just in case you're going somewhere where there's a longer stretch before you're going to get to your next reliable source of water. Okay, so last piece of gear that we're going to talk about right now is clothes. Uh, I would recommend a few just sort of basics when it comes to clothes and I wouldn't overpack clothes. This is something that newbies do all the time, so don't be that newbie. I would recommend a base layer, a mid layer, an insulated jacket, and a rain jacket. For bottoms, I would go with shorts and pants or potentially just going with pants. I personally really like hiking in shorts. Um, I just helps with the heat dissipation. I don't get too hot when I'm hiking in shorts. I do when I'm hiking in pants. So that's just the way that I do it. And then I bring a set of pants that I wear at night, particularly when it gets cold. Uh, but some people can get away with just bringing hiking pants and they still have those zipper off pants too. I know some people use those too, so they kind of get the best of both worlds but I would bring a minimum hiking pants and probably hiking shorts too. And then if it's particularly cold, I would bring a base layer bottom. So I would bring long johns for your bottoms as well. That way you stay warmer at night. It's not fun when you're freezing at night, particularly if you're staying at a place where you can't have a campfire. How many pairs of socks should you bring? Two, two pairs of socks, always two pairs of socks. I wouldn't bring three, I would bring two, but definitely, definitely do not bring one. You're gonna want one of those pairs of socks to be your hiking socks, and the other pair of socks is gonna be your around camp socks. You don't wanna mix those two up because you don't want both your pairs of socks to get really dirty and grimy, and also you have a backup pair in case one of those pairs gets wet when you're crossing a stream or something like that. You want two pairs of underwear also on your trip, and I would highly recommend getting a buff. That's one of those things that goes around your neck. You can pull it over your head to give yourself a little bit extra warmth. You can pull it over your nose like a bandana to help get flies out of your face or to help shield you from the sun. It's especially great for sun on your neck. You can dip it in a stream and then put it on, and it really is like a nice way to cool off. You can also clean stuff with it. Man, I mean, the buff is like so versatile. You gotta bring a buff. I would, you gotta bring a buff, you should buy a buff add it to the mandatory list of gear that you're gonna bring. So let's talk about footwear for a minute. There's basically two different types of footwear that you can wear when you're out in the backcountry. Typically, it's gonna be either your more traditional hiking boot, or you're gonna be looking at something more like a trail runner. Sometimes there's things in the middle that are sort of hybrids, but today we're gonna to talk about those hiking boots, and we're gonna talk about those trail runners. So what are the pros and cons to wearing a hiking boot? 
The pros primarily are, number one, durability. They're typically more thick, more burly, and they're typically more durable. So they last longer, they can take you more miles, and they typically aren't gonna fall apart as much as you might find with a trail runner. Typically, hiking boots, not all of them, but a lot of them will go over your ankle and they do provide an extra layer of support. So if you have issues with your ankles, that might be something you wanna consider when you're debating whether or not you wanna bring a hiking boot or a trail runner. Another pro is that they typically offer more protection. So when you think about a rock plate at the bottom of a shoe, that is typically what provides the protection between your foot and the impact that you're constantly having on the trail. So a thick rock plate is pretty common in a hiking boot, and that can mean that your feet are a little bit less fatigued when you ultimately arrive at your campsite. So that's potentially another pro as well. Cons for hiking boots include weight. So the first thing that I think about is how much weight is on your foot. And hiking boots typically weigh quite a bit more than trail runners do. And actually the Army Research Lab actually did a study on this and they found that for every one pound of weight on your foot, that's equivalent to five pounds of weight on your back. A lot of times people just think about the weight that's on their back, that's what's most top of mind. Even when you're packing, you're weighing your pack, you're not wearing your boots, but you should because your boots actually have a big impact on the amount of fatigue that you're gonna find when you're out there on trail doing a lot of miles. So weight is definitely a con for hiking boots and something to keep in mind when choosing whether or not to go with them. Another con for hiking boots is the fact that they don't dry out very quickly. Because they're thicker, that also means that they're less prone to drying. So that means that if you get water inside your boot, you go through a uh, river crossing or something and you get water in the top of your boot, then all of a sudden you have this waterlogged boot that's gonna take, I don't know, a day or two days to actually dry out. That can be problematic because that can cause infections potentially. You can get trench foot from that. You can also have issues with blisters because of the extra friction that's caused by having a wet hiking boot and therefore a wet hiking sock. So you wanna think about that when you're trying to decide whether or not you wanna go with a hiking boot. Last but not least in terms of cons for hiking boots is they can be a bit clunky. They're a lot bigger than your foot. So when you put them on, you have this non-natural object, this extra large object attached to your foot and you're not really used to that in day-to-day -day life. So that can mean that you're actually less nimble and able to navigate terrain features like if uh, there's a rock that's on a slant or something like that or you need to step over something you may misjudge your ability to do certain actions because a boot is a little more burly and awkward than typical tennis shoe or other shoe that you're probably wearing most of the time in your regular life at home trail runners so what are some of the pros to trail runners number one is weight that's probably the biggest pro to a trail runner it weighs a lot less than a hiking boot so like i mentioned earlier you're saving a lot of fatigue because you're going with a much lighter shoe on your foot that's a major pro another pro for a trail runners are the fact that they dry out much faster because the material is a lot thinner and because they weigh a lot less there is less material that needs to actually dry. So they typically dry out much, much faster than a traditional hiking boot, which in my experience in the backcountry, typically you are gonna get your shoes wet maybe a little bit. And if in some cases you get them really wet, and in either one of those cases, you want those shoes to be able to dry out fast. So that's definitely a pro to a trail runner for sure. The last bit one is that they're molded to your feet. So unlike a boot, like I mentioned a moment ago, they actually do fit much more like a tennis shoe. So when you're navigating over rocks or you're going um, you know, over unstable surfaces, these trail runners are gonna be a lot more nimble. You're gonna be a lot more agile. So that way it feels more natural to you and you're less prone to things like falling, quite frankly. So cons for trail runners include durability. Because the material is thinner, that also means that they're more prone to get rips and tears and have other durability issues. They are not gonna last you as many miles on the trail as a traditional hiking boot would last, so you are gonna to have to replace them more often. Another con for trail runners is that they offer less protection. So those boots that I mentioned earlier obviously offer quite a bit of protection, like I said. These offer quite a bit less, so you're more prone to little nicks and things like that in your ankles if you actually go with a trail runner. Also, the rock plate tends to be a little bit thinner in most cases than a typical boot, so your feet may be a little bit more beat up at the end of the day because you've taken a little bit more of a pounding on the sole of your feet. Last little piece of advice is around the weight of your pack. And if your base weight is 17 pounds or less, you're doing pretty good. If you can get it to 15 pounds or less, that's better. 13 pounds or less is really good. And if you wanna get real crazy with it, Ultra white people would generally say that their base weight is 10 pounds or less, and then extreme ultra white people would say their base weight is five pounds or less. I personally would never go on a backpacking trip with five pounds of base weight because I think you're just sacrificing too many of the good things about backpacking just to have a light pack. 
But there is no debate that having a lighter pack does make for generally a better experience. So if you come in and your base weight is 25, 30 pounds, you have too much stuff. You need to take some of those things out. So I would go through your list again, maybe with a friend, or go through one of these checklists and start to think about what do I really need and what are some things that are just kind of nice to have. And I'd start checking things off that list and removing some of those things from your pack. I know I didn't cover everything when it comes to gear. I know there's a lot more options when it comes to gear. I'm gonna put a checklist in the description of this video so you can go through all those and use that as a resource for yourself when you're out there in the backcountry. Things like headlamps and other items I know I didn't get to, but uh, don't worry, it's in the description below. Travel and logistics. How are you gonna to get to the trailhead and how are you gonna get home from the trailhead? So let's talk about flying for a second first because there's a few things that's worth noting that you cannot fly with and you don't wanna get a rude awakening when you get to the airport and they tell you you can't fly with this thing and then you don't have it when you get to the other end. So those things are bear spray and fuel. Those two things you cannot fly with on the plane. So you're gonna need a friend that's either in the location you're going to to pick that stuff up for you in advance, or you need to find a place where you can stop by and pick some up along the way. Sometimes gas canisters can be a little bit hard to find, so it's probably good idea to call ahead and just make sure that that local shop does have gas in stock a day or two beforehand, just to make sure you're not stuck without canisters. Other fun fact, you need to check your trekking poles. I don't know why I thought that you didn't need to do this, but one time I didn't do this in my earlier backpacking career. And even with the little caps on, it doesn't matter. You can't fly with those in, in the uh, cabin. So make sure that you check that. I ended up actually just taking those trekking poles because they were just gonna get thrown in the trash. I ran around the airport and I found someone who had like a backpacking backpack on and I just asked them if they wanted some free trekking poles. That guy was pretty stoked. <laughs> so hey, at least at least I did a good deed, I guess. I don't know. I was pretty bummed to not have my trekking poles for that backpacking trip and for the rest of my life. Aww. So getting from the airport potentially or from your house to the trailhead is pretty straightforward. You either drive your own car right or you're renting a car. Just figure out who's doing the renting and who's going to pay them back. And also how much space is there in that car? Is there space for all of your bags and all of your backpacks and all of your stuff? plus all of the people, just make sure that's covered, get that knocked out early, then you don't have to think about it. Once you get to the trail in terms of logistics, make sure you don't leave food in your car, particularly if it's a place where you are expecting bears. Bears will totally break into your car while you're backpacking. And I've heard people have their cars broken into with as little as a Yoplate yogurt. Like one of those Yoplait yogurts is just empty and the smell from the empty yogurt was enough to bring a bear out of the woods to the car, they ripped the door off the car. <laughs> and yeah, you don't wanna be, you don't wanna be that person. Next up is safety. Let's talk about some ways that you can stay safe on the trail, your party can stay safe on the trail, and just make sure that you're having a good time and you feel prepared for anything that you might come across. First thing to do, tell someone where you're going. This is pretty obvious, I hope you already know this, but make sure you let somebody know where you are going, when you're going to be there, and give them a copy of your itinerary. You wanna make sure that if you don't show up somewhere, someone's calling the ranger and saying, hey, my loved one or my friend isn't where they're supposed to be, I haven't heard from them, and they're overdue. So give them your itinerary, give them your dates, make sure that they have all the information, and then make a plan that if you don't call them by a certain time, they should start to get worried and they should call this number, which is the park ranger's office number. When you do get back, make sure you call that friend or loved one so that they know that you're okay and they don't start freaking out. So like, make sure you do your part and call them when you are in the clear. <clears throat> Another safety thing I'd recommend is print out your itinerary and put it on the dash of your car. That way, if you're overdue and the car's been parked for a while, a ranger can see your itinerary in the dash and know when you were supposed to be back if you're not back on time. When it comes to maps, I typically have a downloaded version of a map on my phone. A friend will also have another downloaded version of the map on their phone. One of us may have that one of those services that actually tracks your progress around your designated trail using GPS, which is super cool. It is very cool. Um, but I'll also bring a physical copy of the map as well. Next up, I'd say trust your instincts. If you're out on the trail, especially if you're solo, Trust your instincts. If you think this is a kind of a shady place to camp, you don't know about that person you saw on the trail that gave you a funny look, 
go to the next campsite or find some other people that are friendly that are nearby and make sure you camp with them. You can make friends. A lot of people on the trail are super friendly and they'll be happy to have you camp nearby and you won't be bothering them or anything like that. So trust your instincts. They are there for a reason. It's also not a bad idea to bring a first aid kit when you go out in the backcountry. Those typically are really small, they weigh two to three ounces, something like that. And there's some key essentials that you wanna bring with you just to make sure if you happen to get a cut or an abrasion or something like that, that you can help take care of it and not have to worry about any infections. To that point, one of the things you wanna make sure that's in your first aid kit is you wanna make sure you have an antibiotic ointment. You want medical tape and you also want bandages. That way, if you get a nick or a cut, you can make sure that you're not getting any infections there and you can take care of it. Moleskin to make sure that you can avoid hot spots turning into blisters on your feet. This can be a real problem, especially if you're going on a multi-day backpacking trip. If you get a blister, that's not gonna make for a fun trip. It's also a good idea to include something like ibuprofen in your medical kit as well, and then maybe some allergy medication as well. Maybe just a pill or two, just in case you happen to get allergies while you're out there. Sometimes pollen can be high when you're out in the backcountry, and it would be a bummer just to feel kind of crummy all the time. So I typically throw at least a few of those pills in there too, just in case. Let's talk about bears for a couple of minutes because I know this is like a fear that a lot of people have when they go out in the backcountry. Typically speaking, <clears throat> there's a couple of bears that you're gonna encounter, right? There's either the, the black bear or the grizzly bear, also known as the brown bear. It's a little confusing because black bears can also be brown. Or a polar bear, which you hopefully will never see because from what I've heard, that will be really bad. So black bears, what do you do if you see a black bear? Typically speaking, if you see a black bear, you wanna make yourself look big. So that's maybe putting something over your head or holding your hands up, holding your trekking poles out. You're gonna to wanna to make a bunch of noise. Black bears typically scare off pretty easily. So that's typically the approach you wanna take with a black bear. So next up obviously is the grizzly bear. So what's the difference between a grizzly bear and a black bear? I'm gonna show pictures of both of them right here so you can get a little bit of a sense of what is the physical differences between the two. Um, typically speaking though, grizzly bears are quite a bit larger and they have a larger sort of hump by their shoulders. So that's how you can distinguish the two. Black bears can be brown, so you can't just determine it just based off the color. Grizzly bears are a little bit different in terms of temperament and how you wanna deal with them. Typically speaking, you do not want to run from any bear. I would not recommend running from any bear. Uh, but for a grizzly bear, you don't wanna look them in the eyes. You don't necessarily wanna yell or shout at them. If they haven't started approaching you, you wanna back away slowly from the grizzly bear and give them some space. <clears throat> and if a grizzly bear does charge you, or a black bear for that matter, you need to hold your ground. And that is a terrifying thing to experience. And there is a very, 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 very tiny percentage of backpackers who experience it. But if you get charged, don't run, stand your ground. A lot of times bears will do a bluff charge just to see if you react. And if you don't, they turn around and they back off. Last but not least, if you see baby bears, that means mama's nearby. So you wanna give those babies some space. That's actually the most common by far reason for bear attacks out in the back country. So keep your eyes out. If you wanna be extra safe, you can bring little bells that are attached to your backpack. That'll keep bears away. Um, also, you can bring bear spray, which is really effective. Um, but you need to make sure of a couple of things. Number one, does the park you're going to allow bear spray because some parks now don't allow bear spray. And then number two, this is very important because I had a friend make a mistake with this. If you're going to use bear spray, make sure you know which way the wind is blowing. The worst thing that can happen is if a grizzly bear or a black bear is in front of you and they start moving towards you and you get your bear spray out because they're within the range of the bear spray, the wind's blowing towards you and you, blow, you, you blast the bear spray into the wind, it blows back in your face and then you are totally blinded and you know, that's just, that's just not, that's not good. Bear spray is no joke. You do not want to be bear sprayed in the face. Last but not least, as I promised, the tips and tricks at the end of this video. First piece of advice, use all of your gear at least once before you go. That means set up your tent. That means use your water filtration system. That means try the food you're gonna eat. That means blow up your air mattress and make sure that your inflatable mattress works and there's no holes in it. The last thing you wanna do is arrive on the trail, maybe days into your backpacking experience and realize that something is broken, something doesn't work, something that you were counting on. Double check your packed list. Make sure you go over all the items that you're packing for your adventure and go through it twice. I like to get a real big space out on the floors, lay everything out and make super, super sure that everything that I need for my trip is there and then I put it all in the bag and then I do not touch it.
it sits there until I go on that trip, whether it's the next day or if it's the next week, it's just sitting there. I'm not gonna mess with it because I know that I thoroughly checked and everything that I need is in that bag. I'd recommend start hiking early whenever you're out in the backcountry. That way you're not rushed trying to get to your campsite at the end of the day. You don't wanna be hiking with a headlamp. So I try to get up a little earlier than you might think, just so you have some extra time. And then if you get to the campsite early, you can do things like day hikes. You can just lounge around. You can go for a swim in a lake, whatever it is you wanna do. It's better to get there early than get there too late. Next up is take time to take care of yourself. I firmly believe this is a really important thing for you to do, especially if you're a new backpacker. Sometimes if a new backpacker is going with an experienced backpacker, they feel a little uncomfortable saying that they need to stop to take care of something or they feel like they should have known something ahead of time and that's why they're missing water or they you know, put something in their pack that they need to get out like a rain jacket or something and they don't wanna stop or inconvenience the group of more experienced people because they're new and they feel like maybe they should have known better. Scrap all that, none of that matters. You just focus on taking care of yourself. If it's raining and your rain jacket is deep in your pack, put down your pack, get out your rain jacket and put it on. If you ran out of water and there's a stream there and everyone else still has water but you don't, take some time, stop, fill up your water filtration system, fill up your water bladder, and then go hike. These are your friends, they'll wait for you. Honestly, if just one of you all planned a backpacking trip and this was helpful when doing that, I would love to hear about it. If you can share it in the comments below, that would be amazing. I wanna know where you went. I wanna know how the adventure went. I also wanna know if this content was useful. So if it was, please hit the like button. If you're interested in seeing more content like this, hit the subscribe button. We'd love to have you. Thanks everybody for your time. I appreciate it.